I would like to uh, introduce this topic by just saying that, that all of this was put together uh, on the occasion of uh, the visit of Pope John Paul II to Toronto. This goes back a while ago, and we sort of felt that if a person representing the Bible was going to come and, and tell us in Ontario that uh, we were uh, not following the truth and that really to have your sins forgiven, you actually had to see a priest because he was the only person that could, could forgive you. And uh, furthermore, that um, he, he wanted to be able to illustrate that a priest was the only person who could actually change the bread into the body of Jesus Christ and the wine into the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, those were the, the said intentions of the Pope when he came to Toronto. Well, the Pope was a sick man, a very sick man at that time. It was towards the end of his life. And he, the best he could do was pretty well to walk off the airplane. And uh, as you know, his tradition was to, to get on his knees and, and kiss the ground. And uh, Canada is, a, is quite a Catholic nation. About half of the people who are religious are Catholics in Canada. So uh, a school system in Ontario uh, funds two groups. One is the public, the general public, and the other is the Catholic system. Nobody else is funded. So CHC, uh, no, you don't get any funds, you don't get anything at all from the government in Canada, just the Catholics and the public system. So uh, Catholics are fairly strong and uh, we felt we had an obligation to, to say something because he was coming over on World Youth Day. He's coming over to visit in a, in a mass in a big uh, abandoned military field in the north part of Toronto and he wanted all the 18 to 35 year old people to come to visit him. Well, who wouldn't want the 18 to 35 year old people? I mean, that's, that's the, the, uh, the choice age in which we want to start people off into many different things. So we were, were trying to uh, educate our children and, uh, and this was the result of it. I visited uh, this place in Rome San Pietro, we visited that three times to go through and just see what we could see to try to help people understand uh, where the Catholics were coming from. You can see that uh, it was under a state of repair this time we visited it, but at least they had that big sign out in front, otherwise people might not have known the place as, as well as they normally see it when it was, it was clean. It was very dirty after all the years of accumulating uh, just the... the, the uh, the air particles, uh, the pollution that was in the area. So here we go. <clears throat> now I want to start this off by asking you a question. And uh, you try to give this an answer. You're going to work in the morning, okay? Or, or you're out walking around in the morning and you just happen to stumble upon this house. There's nobody around and you see it on fire like this. And the question is, what would you do? Now, I've talked this over with a fireman who, who told me what he would do. So um, it wasn't too much different than I think that most of you would think to do. Begin, just look it over very carefully. You notice the car is in the laneway. The car is on fire. You notice that the fire is, uh, is proceeding from one end of the house. And what he told me is what he would do is he and another person on the fire truck would go to the front door of the house, which is around the side here a little bit, and one man with a hose and one man with an ax. And he said they'd get into the house one way or another, and they would approach it from inside the house looking for anybody that happened to be in the house. So the object wasn't just to put the fire out. The object was to see if there's anybody they could save before that house got any first. That's, that's quite a blaze. Now I want you to think about the spiritual thing, because this is not a, a lesson on how to put a fire out in the house. <laughs> but there's a connection, because if you look at this verse, many Christadelphians would have seen this verse before and reasoned over it. In Ezekiel 33, verse 6, If a watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, the people be not warned. If the sword come and take away any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, 
but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. And you can't help but think when you're reading the Bible that, that God holds us accountable when we see people doing wicked things to, to say something or react in some way. Just be too bad if we're just prepared to live with all this evil and never speak uh, what God thinks of it to people. Because really that would be like saying, well, the house is on fire. I hope you get it out and keep on walking. And I hope that touches you a little bit. Because if we're so callous concerning other religions that we just say, well, you know, you, you choose to believe that, then, then just go with it. Then we just sit by. We don't let these, these occasions that, that are given to us have any influence on us at all. And many of these things are occasions. It's when people are, are suddenly awakened to something spiritual in their minds because, you know, they're... Their top man is coming to visit them. And it just may be that there is an opportunity there to speak to them. You see, the Catholics make a fatal mistake right away. And I've got all my quotes in here, so you, I will not quote the Catholics unless I show you what their quote is. Because you don't want to misquote people. We got this out of the Catholic Catechism. I have a catechism. It's a very used book in my library because I refer to it all the time and it's got many little parts sticking out of it to illustrate where it is. But the Catholic Catechism, written in 1994, number 82, I think there, it goes up to thousands of, of things. Imagine the Christadelphian statement of faith if it had thousands of clause in it. We have enough trouble with just the 30 we have, but they have thousands of them. As a result, the church to whom the transmission and interpretation of Revelation is entrusted does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. May our God forbid that we would ever do that. We would ever think that our tradition, our books, the things that brethren have written about the Bible, would ever have equal sentiment and devotion with the Bible itself. And so when you see the, Christ, when you see the, the Catholics defending a point of belief, you might never see a Bible passage at all. You just might see that some Catholic in the past stated this, or some council of the, of the Catholics together stated it. And for them, that's equal authority. That's a fatal mistake. Almost everything that comes from this talk is based on that mistake. We have to use the Bible as the authority when we're talking about Christianity. So as our brother Thomas very often used this verse, so we still use it, Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. And we, we'd say to them, well, where does the Bible support that viewpoint? Like, where do you get that from the Bible? And to hear someone say, well, as my brother Ron, uh, you know, visited a, a man who was wanting to see him because he was talking to some of his uh, people of, of, uh, in his church, he, uh, he immediately grabbed the Bible out of my brother's hand and threw it across the room. He said, you don't need that in here. All you need is to, to listen to what the church says, because for them, the church is the authority. Well, we don't do that. We keep the Bible and we reason from it. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. We take that seriously. We don't treat lightly when our brethren or when our children suggest that maybe there's some other way to look at this than the Bible says. No, because this tells us that there is only one gospel. And anything different than that, uh, there's a curse associated with it. You take that seriously. Well, you see, the chapter we read in 2 Thessalonians said there would be an apostasy in the Christian church. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Well, what does falling away mean? Well, it's 
apostasia, which is uh, a word which means a defection from the truth, or an apostasy as we normally refer to it, a falling away, a forsaking of the truth. So reading that into the, the word falling away then, it says, let no man deceive you by any means, for the day of the Lord's return will not come except there first be uh, an apostasy, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And so historically, there was a necessity before the Lord come that this apostasy be recognized and the man of sin be revealed. So regardless of, of who you might think that is, that's what the Bible says had to happen before the Lord would come back. Now what I've done here and uh, what we've done with, with, uh, in concert with other brethren who were working on it together, was we went through 20 different things. I think there was actually a few more than that, but it, it was nicely represented on the slide to have 20 identifying characteristics. And all we wanted to do was just see where was the best fit. So you may not be convinced of this by looking at any one thing, but if you look at 20 things, and you can see that they all point in one direction, and that you can't think of a, another organization, another group that lived in history, you, you can't think of anything that could ever has 20 things associated with it like this does, you get the idea of who the Bible's speaking about. Because, you know, it's okay for us to say these things in, in this company, because we all essentially believe this already. But... When you come and you say it in public, you go to a, a, a park in the city and say, this is what we believe this is talking about, you have gotta be prepared for someone to say, well, I disagree, and you know, they, they, uh, they can disagree pretty strongly with what you have to say. So I just wanna show you how we're gonna do this. We're just gonna go through a few of these and have a look at it, and, and then come to some conclusion. So a Christian beginning, because that's where we started. We wanna show you that this apostasy doesn't come from some other religion. It, it doesn't come from, you know, people thinking about robots and, uh, and all the science fiction that we, we see in the world today. No, it had a Christian beginning because when you look at Acts chapter 20, verses 29 to 31, it says uh, the Apostle Paul said to the people of Ephesus, the, the elders of Ephesus, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. This was big to the Apostle Paul. He would never be able to say uh, to the people who were right in front of him that I've done this by the space of three years, warning you, everyone, night and day with tears. They were there. They listened to him. They saw him. So that was a large amount of what the, uh, the Apostle Paul had to say, because look at the outcome. There would be people who would enter into the ecclesia like grievous wolves enter to a flock of sheep, not sparing the flock. And then there would be some of themselves who are rising and speaking perverse things with the intent of drawing away disciples after them. So this didn't speak very well for the, the, uh, the Christian church. I use that in, a, in the sort of the ordinary sense. Second Timothy chapter four, verses three and four. The time will come, the apostle went on to say to Timothy, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. Well, that's something that's been going on in time, and it's, uh, it's really got a, uh, an application to our present day, because I don't think that there's anything quite like the Internet to provide something for itching ears. And if you turn the Internet on and you're serving, searching the Internet, you'll find so many ideas that uh, if you just like these ideas, that you spend all your time with those ideas. Well, itching ears leads to that behavior and it apparently started quite early after the beginning. So we don't make too much of any one point if, unless we see it needs to be, but certainly you, you need to see the Christian beginning. 
Now, there's some cleverness to the way people have dealt with these objections, and the Catholics are very, very good at answering objections. And there's a number of books, I have a couple, at least a couple in my library, of, of Catholics writing to the objections of the points we're making. And I'll show you this one, because this is what they say. When the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, as we read in verses 7 and 8, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. We would say that this problem of, of the apostasy starting was already working at the time of the apostle, right back in the first century. It wasn't something that was going to happen you know, centuries and centuries later with no beginning. No, it started right away. But it would go on until the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord would consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So, see, those two verses are very, very important in establishing this. That it was something that would start in the first century and it would stretch right through to the coming of the Lord. Well, there's not many things that are alternatives to this. What else can you say started in the first century and lasted right through all the centuries to our present time that was something that was an apostasy, a falling away of the truth? So when the Catholics take this up, this is a page from a book written by a Catholic priest, very clever priest, who was trying to answer all the objections of, uh, of the Protestants. And if you can find this book, if you want to just note that author, John A. O'Brien, the title of the book is The Faith of Millions. It was written in 1963. Um, it's going to take a lot of time to read that book, but it's a good reference book, because once you've done it, you, you probably would want to refer to some of it later on. But he says this. In 33 AD, Jesus Christ founded the Catholic Church, because, you see, they feel Peter was the first pope, so as far as they're concerned, when the, Catholic, when the Christian Church started, it was Catholic. So... They claim they started back in 33 AD. And he says, look at this. Now, this is 63. Roman Catholics by that time had a population of 558 million people around the world. Much bigger today, although the population is shifting from one area to another. And then they claim, well, look at, by comparison, the Lutherans. Because Martin Luther started Protestantism in Germany in 1524, and they've only got 260, 16 million. Now, who do you think is right? Well, anybody looking at this had ever thought about this before. Is it looks like the Catholics would be right because, you see, they started way back at the beginning and they went right through and, and they're still growing because that's the nice way the, the wedge shows are growing. But if you said, let's really look at this longevity argument. And let's put in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And then say, who is wrong instead of who is right? You get a very different argument. Because now, you're not looking for something to start 1500 AD. You're looking for something that started as that uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 says, right back at the time that book was written. There's only one possible answer to who was wrong. That's the way you've got to deal with the Catholic arguments. And it really requires uh, brethren to have the time to, to concentrate on these things. And we're, if we're so busy at our jobs and we're so busy in our careers and we're, we're so busy with this and that that we can't spend hours also sitting at your desk and studying these things. You never really ever get this. This takes a lot of time. And uh, I'm not suggesting I spend a lot of time in it, but I have read people and, and do cherish the readings of people who have spent a lot of time on it and try to manage their arguments so that you can really handle that argument. So there's the longevity one. It sits on seven mountains. Now, I don't know if possibly the Auckland was built on seven hills. I don't know if anybody would claim that, that uh, you know, this city is built on seven hills. I don't see a lot of hills right where the city is here, but there's many people that claim there's cities built on seven hills, but there's a difference. Because when it's said in Revelation 17, verse 9, and here is the mind which hath wisdom, 
the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, we found it extraordinary <laughs> to be able to go to Rome, pick up a travel guide for Rome. I don't know who, well, I do know who it wrote it because we have it down here, a picture of it. Just a, a, a travel guide to get you around Rome. And then find that just, I think it was on about the fourth or fifth page, this picture. The seven hills of Rome. Now, I doubt that you would ever find any other major city in the world today that would have that famous background to it. That even in a travel guide, you can see that historically it was famous because it had seven hills. Now, the, obviously the city has grown beyond seven hills, but it's still famous for its seven hills. That's the wisdom of God, to my mind. God knew that this city would be famous for seven hills, and so the Apostle John wrote this up in the record, and here we have it for those trying to identify it. So there's another one, just little ones, but nevertheless, they're there. Now, it's a mother organization. We say that because, well, uh, I'll show it to you in the slide here. I went to the, to the Vatican. I went into St. Peter's Square, and I, I was just amazed to be able to look up at this building. It's a very odd-shaped building, but I saw this shape here. Now, here's a mother and a child, and underneath it is Mater Ecclesia. Now, most Christadelphians will make something of that if you don't know anything about Latin. Mater, mother, Ecclesia, church. Mother, church. They want to be known as the mother church. And this Cardinal Ratzinger, who went on to be Pope Benedict, who is now the one who is retired, made this statement September 2. I remember when he made this statement. I, I remember writing it down at the very time. I thought, this is, this is really fascinating. It must always be always clear that the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic universal church is not the sister, but the mother of all churches. To be sister is to be equal. To be mother is to be foremost. And that's the way they wanted themselves to be presented. Well, Revelation 17, verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So what the, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, is that this organization must be a mother well, that church building says it's a mother. The, the minister inside who claims to be number one, he says it's the mother. What other organization claims to be the mother? You see, when you look at these things like that, and you, and you look at 20 characteristics, it's not just necessarily one of them that makes a big impression to you. It's just the weight of the evidence all over. as when you accumulate it. You look at, a man led by a man of sin. Why would he use that expression? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come except there be a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, that's a gain a very hard thing to find in history that anybody would ever make that claim. So I did some reading, and I, I found there's a lot of books that you can read that are uh, contemporary books so that you don't end up making your argument based on Christadelphian viewpoint. You, you make it on a, on a viewpoint that other people have been able to recognize as well, and you find that these kinds of things actually have a lot of weight in them. So here's a book written by an author, Gary Wills, called Papal Sin. And uh, this is what he had to say, or a little bit on the cover. That papal sin in the past was blatant, as Catholics themselves realized, when they painted popes roasting in hell on their own church walks. Surely the great abuses of the past, the nepotism, murders, wars of conquest, no longer prevail. Yet the sin of the modern papacy as revealed by Gary Wills in his penetrating new book, is every bit as real, though less obvious, than the old sins. There's the book, Papal Sin, Structures of Deceit. Gary Wills, Double Day cover, and it's, uh, it's I don't put the date on that, but it's, uh, it's quite a, a recent book. 
So you see that uh, this is not the, the, the Christadelphians pointing the finger at the Catholics and saying, this is what we think of you, there's a man of sin. This is a writer who has a gut that acts to grind, but he's able to point out that even the modern popes basically are all associated with the idea of deceit and sin. So we look at apostolic succession, which is a real big one in the Catholic Church because they believe that identifies them, that they are, uh, Peter was the first pope, and uh, all these other popes are just in succession. Well, was Peter the first pope? Well, Peter was the speaker, but James was the leading apostle in the Jerusalem conference. If, if he's the first pope, if he's the papa, if he's the leader, then why didn't he take the lead in Acts chapter 15, verse 13? Uh, Peter was not infallible. Now, understandably, you have, to, you have to know the way the Catholic Church speaks of that. They don't mean this man is always infallible, that he always says things that, uh, that can't be refuted in any sense. They believe that infallibility only relates to when he, when he speaks ex cathedra, when he's, when he's saying something about the, the morals or the doctrines and teachings of the church that he can't be wrong. So you want to always be very careful, speaking in public, that uh, we define what infallible means in a, in a Roman Catholic understanding. But Peter wasn't infallible. As surely Paul had to rebuke him for his weakness at Antioch, which you would sort of wonder why people would claim Peter as the first pope uh, when that happened. Maybe Paul would have been a better one. Nevertheless, again, in number three here, Peter never reigned over the other apostles and, and spoke against it in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3. But you see um, the Pope today, when we, we, there's been a number of popes in my lifetime, you've been able to see what happens when a new pope is, is established. The cardinals all sort of bow down to him because they recognize him reigning over them. They recognize, recognize that person as the person who is representing Jesus Christ on earth. So in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3, we certainly don't see Peter saying that. He, he speaks against it. There is no biblical evidence that Peter was ever in Rome, let alone its bishop, or buried there. Like there's just the Bible doesn't say anything about that at all. So that's got to come from some other source than the Bible. Neither was Peter the rock upon which Jesus built his church in Matthew 16, verse 18. Now, if you're ever going to speak to Catholics, you've got to know that argument. That argument is well-defined and developed in the book Rested Scriptures, written by Ron Abel. And it is, uh, it's one that the Catholics will almost surely go to, to illustrate that when Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, supposedly speaking to Peter and meaning Peter, you'd have to be able to explain from the text itself why that's not so. Peter was married. We know that from Mark 1, verse 30, but a Catholic explanation is it doesn't mean that. Well, it's pretty plain. So you want to just make sure that when people say it doesn't mean that, that they have an argument. And then no pope or elder in the Roman church can do today what Peter did when he was an apostle. There is no, no comparison. That verse, Acts 5, verses 1 to, or that verses from uh, Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, is the time when Peter passed by people that were laying on beds of sickness, and a shadow falling upon the people, they were healed. What pope ever in history could do that? Could the present pope do that? If these people really are in succession, and Peter was the first one, why haven't they got the power of Peter? Now you see, once again, it's an argument you build up from little bits, but put the bits together, it becomes quite compelling that Peter was not the first pope. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse uh, 1 to 2, it says, but there were false apostles, uh, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And I suggest to you that not just the evidence of Gary Wills in his book about papal sin, but many things that you can get out of the news today 
that will illustrate to you that this man certainly doesn't represent the Lord Jesus Christ in the way he lives or in what he represents. Noted for blasphemy. Again, here's the man today. He's the man who is taking these titles, Holy Father and His Holiness. Now look, as Chris and Elphins, we should be able to be right on this. How could a man, any man, uh, lay claim to the title of Holy Father and also at the same time claim to be a Christian? In Matthew 23, verse 9, it says, Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Now that's obviously not referring to talking to your dad, who really is your father. It's giving a, a title to a person and calling that person father in a spiritual sense. Call no man father is what Jesus was referring to. And then again in verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come unto thee, holy father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. That's the only reference in the Bible to the phrase holy father. And it refers to God. Who would ever want to be given that title that's a man? I mean, the arrogancy and the, and the blasphemy associated with that, I don't know if there's a better example of blasphemy than to assume the title of Holy Father when it only is used as it refers to God himself. In Revelation 15, verse 4, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. All nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. God alone is holy. So when you see these names being used, you want to really think about it. So I took this little clip. This is June 10th this year, so this is very recent. I wanted to show you how in, in the contemporary use in, in the press and how they talk about the Pope in the world, that they use those terms. So here's something that was uh, quoted. Uh, you, can, you can see where uh, I got it from, just from the web. And uh, it's... Uh, from Reuters, somewhere along the line of reporting. But anyway, it could be found by that website. Ahead of the talks, the leader of the Rome-aligned Ukrainian church, Catholic church. Now, you've got to look for these buzzwords because it's Rome-aligned. They don't mean Italian. They mean Vatican. Okay, they're talking about the religious part of Rome. They're talking about the, the fact that it's, it's Rome. Well... You might find that some people say it's not Rome. Like there's, uh, the Bible never mentions the fact that it's Rome. It says it's Babylon. Well, I think uh, I've found enough quotes on that one to solve that one if anyone ever pressed me on it. And this is a good example that when it says the leader of the Rome-aligned Ukrainian church, that that's Rome-aligned only in the sense it's aligned with the Catholic church. It's not with the Italian government. And uh, he expressed hope that the talks between Putin and Francis will help stop war in Ukraine. This uh, particular man of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church told reporters in the Polish capital, Warsaw, on June 9th, that he believed that the Christians should strive to promote peace and reconciliation. And his parishioners prayed every day for peace in Ukraine's east, where more than 6,400 people have been killed in just over a year of fighting. Between Ukrainian armed forces and pro-Russian separatists, Ukraine's independence is a matter of European security and peace in the European Union, the Archbishop told journalists, adding that Francis was well-informed about what is happening in Ukraine and calling the pontiff's meeting with Putin the one way to stop this war. So he summarizes it saying, we Catholics believe that the Holy Father, there it is, that's the contemporary use of the term Holy Father for the Pope, we Catholics believe the Holy Father, as a follower of Christ on earth, has a special grace of the Holy Spirit which will not allow the continuation of this aggression and war, the Archbishop said. So you can see what Catholics themselves make of how they've elevated this man to be Holy Father and how they believe that God's given him a special grace to be able to stop war. I wonder if they really examine history to see if, if that had an historical background or they just think that today. So when this man has 
these titles applied to him, his father, Holy Father and His Holiness, two titles that only are used to God in the Bible, I think that's a very ample uh, uh, sort of reporting of what this idea of the titles of blasphemy we have in our chart. I don't know where you'd ever find that in any other organization. The calls for celibacy. Now, this has got the Catholic Church into a turmoil and a great lot of trouble in Canada. I don't know what, it, what happens in, in New Zealand here, but they've got themselves into a lot of trouble in Canada. You see, it said, Paul said this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of, of devils speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Well, I don't know how many of us can remember the time when, when Catholics didn't eat meat on Fridays. Can you remember that? Because I certainly remember it back in, in my time. But you see, our kids wouldn't know that. They wouldn't necessarily know that ever was true. And they might not even be able to recognize this forbidding of Mary to marry, but do a little reading. In the cate Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says, in this number, number 1579, all the ordained ministers of the Latin Church, with the exception of permanent deacons, are normally chosen from among men of faith who live a celibate life and who intend to remain celibate for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So what the Catholic Church wants is a priesthood that's celibate. They don't marry. And that's got them into the difficulty that's being reported, like in this book here. This is an interesting book, because this book was written about an experience that happened in Newfoundland, out in the very far east coast of Canada. And uh, the, the Catholics had set up orphanages all across the country, because they... They were right behind the pioneers of Canada. And uh, their idea was that they were going to convert the natives of, of, of Canada to Catholicism. And so you can still see the remnants right up in our own province, close to where we used to live in Shelburne. There is a, 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 a place there which is a, a, a sort of a monument to the Catholics' work in that area. But I, I wouldn't doubt that that would be hidden because of, of this problem. So it's called Unholy Orders, Tragedy at Mount Cashel, uh, written by Michael uh, Harris. And one of the things he said was this, once more, Mount Cashel couldn't be ignored. Auxiliary Bishop Frederick Bernard Henry of London, Ontario, observed for the record that Canadian priests experienced deep soul searching after the winter report found that priests in Newfoundland had sexually abused children and church leaders had failed to take action. Although some bishops tried to raise the issue of celibacy, Pope John Paul made it very clear that he had no intention of reforming the controversial vow. And that's what got the Catholic Church into the, into the problem they were in because they knew this was going on and they, they covered it up. And when the, the uh, various people that were affected by this started to go to the press and reveal their stories to it, then there was a whole lot of lawsuits. And I'm just amazing at the wealth of this organization, to be able to pay the millions of dollars that they've been sued for and won in court. Uh, not the Catholics won, but people have won against them. And it, it, is, it is really a black eye. If Christadelphians were ever known for this, we probably wouldn't be allowed to be in the city. Catholics survive on it. You'll see the Pope is constantly apologizing for this and trying to, to, to get, you know, to heal the, the Catholic Church and, and uh, the nations in which he goes and works in because of this problem of the abuse of children. And uh, I even found that there was a brother in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, who was in an orphanage and knew all about this abuse firsthand and uh, became a Christadelphian and uh, could tell anybody, if they doubted about it, what actually went on. Well, the widespread corruption is also illustrated in this book, The Priest, the Woman, and the Confessional by Chinoquy. Now, uh, this is an old book, but uh, it just this is a little test to what it says. 
It, it was not very long after my ordination when a priest came to me to confess the most deplorable things. He honestly told me there was not a single one of the girls or married women whom he had confessed who had not been a secret cause of the most shameful sins in thoughts, desires, or actions. But he wept so bitterly over his degradation, his heart seemed so sincerely broken under the count of his own iniquities that I could not refrain from mixing my tears with his. And uh, I must say, having read that book, I couldn't really recommend it. That would be something you'd want to read unless you really got into this and you needed the evidence. It's a, it's a book that uh, just... You just can't believe how degrading it is. You know, the, the Catholic Church is a polished church. Like, they, they've got a polish on them that's it's well above the, the, uh, the polish on, the, on, on the, the Protestant community. There was a number of years ago, we did a little work with a group of young people that generally goes out in the, in the summertime to go from ecclesia to ecclesia to help them with their preaching work. So what we thought we would do is we'd take... Uh, and sent a letter to, to every uh, church that existed in southern Ontario in our area, and we'd ask them if they would, if they would uh, allow our young people to come and listen to them. Either they, we go to their church or they come to ours. And what we wanted them to do was to tell them, where did you come from? Like, how did your church get, get organized? And do you really believe in the Trinity? And do you believe in the ecumenical movement? And uh, then give the young people an opportunity of maybe 20 minutes to ask questions, uh, no debating. Now, I thought that was a, a reasonable thing to say. We did pass it by the arranging brother, and it's not something we would do without doing that. And so we, we, uh, we uh, went out to the community. And we sent letters to Jehovah's Witness, to the Mormons, to the Latter-day Saints, to the Catholics, to the Anglican Church, to the United Church, to little evangelical churches in the, in the area. And I would say that the Catholics, in the way they presented themselves, uh, would be the number one presenters. Second would be the Seventh-day Adventists. And after that, it just fell off. Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't even meet with us. They wouldn't take advantage of an occasion to have 20 young people from Chris and Elvin come down and, and, and uh, a person from the Jehovah's Witness organization tell them what they believed. For all the witnessing these people claimed to do, I thought that was, uh, that was pretty low. But when the Catholics, when we went to the Catholics, the man was there, he, he walked, the priest was there, he welcomed us into the church and you know, the kids are looking around and see all these big statues. And, oh, I see you're looking at them. He says, now look, get this straight. He says, these statues are just to help people prepare. You see, if you recognize this as, as uh, Joseph's mother, you'd be thinking good thoughts when you came into the church. That's how he tried to pass it off. And then it went into this place where there was water, holy water, and people were washing their hands as they go in. He says, now look, you see, we gotta got to tell people, when you come out of that world, You've got to get rid of those worldly thoughts. So you wash your hands and you come in and you, you, you partake of, of godly things. You know, really quite interesting. We went around the corner and here's this, what looked like a cage. And the kids were saying, well, what is this? And it's a confessional booth. The priest sits on one side, the person that's being confessed sits on the other side, and then he went to explain some of the exchange. And then finally he took us up to the front row and he sat down and he said to us, he says, you know, I know you people aren't Catholics. And he says, it's not likely that too many of your parents are Catholics. Maybe some of your grandparents. And it, it increases as we go into the generations. He says, you go back far enough. You are all Catholics. Welcome home. Man, talk about smooth and clever. Hey, he's going to welcome us all home. He didn't care who we were. He's gonna, he wants us. So he, he went to work. Well, I tell you, those young people could see right through this. And uh, he, he was talking about all those smooth things, but he didn't answer our questions. He didn't answer anything about the Trinity. He had much to say about the ecumenical movement. And the kids picked this up right away. So when it came to the discussion period, we couldn't really discuss much, but just say, well, what do you believe about these things? They're a very smooth organization. It's a wealthy trader. 
In the latter part of Revelation, it says that the great city was clothed in fine linen, purple, scarlet, decked with gold, precious stones, and pearls. That's the, the last picture we get. Well, you go into the Vatican, there's the triple tiara. There's the, uh, a crown that would normally sit on, a, on, a, on the Pope's head. I don't know how much it weighs, but with all those precious stones in there, it must be quite significant. And most of the recent popes don't want to have touched that thing because uh, people might get the impression that the Catholic Church is rich. Well, how would you like to walk down that hall and think anything else? It's just loaded with wealth. We walked around the, the, this building, uh, St. Peter's Cathedral, they call it, and everything looked like it was just made out of gold, out of marble, out of silver. It was just, just a wealth and luxury is all you could see wherever you went. You want to read this book. A Wealthy Traitor, Money, Murder, and the Mafia, The Vatican Exposed. Those are the books that are out there. And, you know, this is not Chris and Elfin writers. You want to read some of these books if you, if you need to have that kind of, uh, of evidence. With over 50 billion in securities, gold reserves that exceed those of some industrialized nations, real estate holdings that equal the total area of many countries, opulent palaces containing the world's greatest art treasures, the riches of the Roman Catholic Church are enormous. Yet in 1929, the Vatican was destitute. This is recent. This is after John Thomas. This is after Robert Roberts. This is the recent appearance of the Roman Catholic Church. And it's exactly as Revelation 17 and 18 says, very wealthy organization. Well, how did they get wealthy? And that book uh, tells you things that you would not know otherwise. Transubstantiation. I don't know what you think of this, but this is, this is where the priest of the Catholic Church is supposed to be able to take what we call bread and wine and make that bread into the actual flesh of Jesus and the wine into the actual blood of Jesus. But in a Roman Catholic communion, the, the, the wine has been taken out of it. They just pass this little, well, they don't pass it. Someone comes along and puts a wafer on your tongue because you're not supposed to chew it, because at that stage, it's the body of Jesus. You're not supposed to let crumbs fall out of your mouth, because that's part of the body of Jesus that you're, you're sort of desecrating. So it's, it's all done with this idea that that priest can do that. Now, you just go through this with me. This came, when you look at it, trans, transubstantiation, you look at the catechism, you say, well, where did they ever get this from the Bible? And this came the Council of Trent. In, in uh, I don't know if it says the date here, but this is about the time that they, uh, the Protestants started rebelling against this thing. So it says, it summarizes the Catholic faith by declaring, because Christ our Redeemer said it was true, truly his blood that he was offering under the species of bread. It has always been the conviction of the Church of God, and this Holy Council now declares again that by the consecration of the bread and wine, there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord, and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change, the Holy Catholic Church, is fittingly and properly called transubstantiation. So a big word, but that's what it means. Now, I found this in a book that I was reading, and I thought, this, this is clever. Um, first of all, when we look at the verses which, which uh, really the Catholic Church is basing it on, if you didn't read verse 63, you might think that there was some substance to it. But Jesus clearly said, it's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It wasn't that people had to eat his flesh. They had to drink his blood. It was that they had to do what that symbolized, just like people had to eat a book. And the book was to assume the, 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 uh, the work that that book was going to do and, and uh, the words that it, that it had to say. So I'm going to read this. This is poetry. But it's a, it's a clever poem, and I, I think you will follow this uh, when, when you see it. So it, it says, A pretty maid, a Protestant, was to a Catholic wed. To love all Bible truths and tales, quite early she's been bred. It sorely grieved her husband's heart that she would not comply and join the Mother Church of Rome and heretics deny. 
So day by day he flattered her, but still she saw no good. Whatever come from bowing down to idols made of wood. The mass, the host, the miracles were made but to deceive, and transubstantiation, too, she never dare believe. He went to see his clergyman and told him his sad tale. My wife is an unbeliever, sir. Can you perhaps be prevail? For all your Romish miracles, my wife has strong aversion. To really work a miracle may lead to her conversion. The priest went with the gentleman he thought to gain a prize. He said, I'll convert her, sir, and open both her eyes. So when they came into the house, the husband loudly cried, The priest has come to dine with us. He's welcome, she replied. And when at last the meal was over, the priest at once began to teach his hostess all about the sinful state of man, the greatness of the Savior's love, which Christians can't deny, to give himself a sacrifice and for our sins to die. I'll return tomorrow, lass. Prepare some bread and wine. The sacramental miracle will stop your soul's decline. I'll bake the bread, the lady said. You may, he did reply. And when you've seen this miracle convinced you'll be, say I. The priest did come accordingly. The bread and wine did bless. The lady asked, sir, is it changed? The priest answered, yes. It's changed from common bread and wine to truly flesh and blood. The girl, alas, this power of mine has changed it into God. So having blessed the bread and wine to eat, they did prepare. The lady said unto the priest, I warn you to take care, for half an ounce of arsenic was mixed right in the batter. But since you've changed its nature, it cannot really matter. The priest was struck real dumb. He looked as pale as death. The bread and wine fell from his hands, and he did gasp for breath. Bring me my horse, the priest requ- uh, cried. This is a cursed home. The lady replied, Be gone, tis you who shares the curse of Rome. The husband, too, he sat surprised, and not a word did say. At length he spoke, My dear, said he, the priest has run away. To gulp such mummery and tripe, I'm not for sure quite able. I'll go with you, and we'll renounce this Roman Catholic fable. I don't know who wrote that. That's clever. You see, if the Catholics could change the bread and the wine, completely change it to the body and blood of Jesus, there would be no need to worry about what was fixed in that bread. But the priest wasn't willing to take the chance. <laughs> anyway, that is the, the, uh, the end. The Bible speaks for the Roman Catholic Church in Revelation 18. She shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Now I have one left, and if you'll just bear with me for the, the time this would take. It's just a few minutes, but I think it's worth it. They have no love for Bible truth. Now, when you have no love for Bible truth, the Bible says something happens to you. If you don't love the truth, brothers and sisters, young people, if you don't develop any love for truth, truth is not just something that that we call the truth. It's something that's true always. It's never untrue. It's something that's not just partly true, it's all true. So there is no part of it you don't want us to talk about. It's all true. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 12 says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness, unrighteousness, and them that perish because they receive not the love of truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they might all be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There's a curse associated with people who do not have a love of the truth. You want to believe that? They just go on your way and believe it. And it seems to me then, it would be very unlikely you would ever find the truth. So look at this. If you put these things on a table, you build them up, So we have church authority. We've already said, if the Catholics say that we believe the Bible, but only in so much as half of what we say, and the other half is what we ourselves think, then church authority is very weak to build on. And uh, so in that reference, that scripture and tradition must be accepted with equal sentiments, that's the fatal mistake. 
But then they launch into this immortal soul, and it must have been one of the first false doctrines that was taught, that we have an immortal soul. Now, I'm sure as Christadelphians, we know the significance of the teaching of an immortal soul or a mortal soul. If you have an immortal soul, you have a problem that you have to deal with when people say, well, where did the immortal soul go? So the Roman Catholic Church says this. You see, you, if you got this, and you got rid right of their catechism, and you know where it's, you can find it, people will accept what you have to say. The church teaches that every spiritual soul is created immediately by God. It is not produced by the parents. And also that it is immortal. It does not perish when it separates from the body at death. And it will be reunited with the body at the final resurrection. That's the teaching of the Catholic Church. Well, but the Bible says man became a living soul when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And again, the soul that sinneth, it shall die in Ezekiel 18, verse 4. So it's directly at odds with the Bible to teach that one has an immortal soul. But if you do, then you have to come up with what happened when they died. So right away, you would say that judgment occurs the moment a person dies. Quite different than what we believe the Bible teaches. That judgment occurs when people are raised from the dead at the return of Jesus Christ. It misplaces the judgment immediately by that teaching of the immortal soul. There wouldn't be any heaven at death, but they have to have something happens because you're immediately judged, so the judgment's going to produce someone that's righteous. Well, they've got to go to heaven because that immortal soul teaching demands that you make that discrimination. Well, it also means, I think that's a little more devious, the idea of purgatory, because hell at death and heaven at death are, are two things that you can see, the bad people, the good people. Purgatory is clever. These people are, are, are going to get to heaven, but unless the people who are living support them, they probably won't get to heaven. So that's a way you can work on the love that people have had for their loved ones who have died to, to keep supporting the church. Clever, clever argument. Sprinkling. Well, why would you sprinkle them? Because what happens if a child dies and it's not old enough uh, to accept the church? But if we sprinkle it because it's got an immortal soul, then we're going to save that soul. You can see the relationship between these ideas. Limbo, well, what happens to a person, because we've got to explain what happens to a person that dies before they're sprinkled. We put them in limbo. We haven't heard much about limbo recently, but that's on the, on the books. Universal resurrection, because if you've got an immortal soul, then everybody's going to come back in time. And Mary, the queen of heaven, would never be Mary, the queen of heaven, if you didn't have the teaching of the immortal soul, because how would she be in heaven? The intercession of saints, big one, talked about in the news all the time by the Pope. He just made it a couple Palestinians, saints, which means that those Palestinians now can pray to fellow Palestinians in heaven and expect that they would be able to work a miracle in their life. It's called deceit in the Bible. And you can see if you build it on deceit, then everything you teach is deceitful. And then indulgence says, well, that's, that was put Martin Luther over the top because he couldn't stand how the Catholic Church was using the sale of indulgences to work on people supposedly in purgatory. Now, if you take the idea of, of the immortal soul out, you just say, look, that's God. You can see that uh, the rest of it doesn't have much going for it because really there's no support because it all came about because of the idea of the immortality of the soul. You know, sprinkling, heaven at death, and uh, universal resurrection, it's gone. Mary, queen of heaven, she's gone. Intercession of saints, they're gone. Take a little longer because the popes keep talking about this. And then finally, indulgences, it's gone. Hey, there's nothing left to this church. You get the idea. You build it on false premise. If you ignore the teaching, the clear teaching in the Bible, and say, no, we will take the teaching of the church as well, you're left with nothing. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Now, I don't want to leave it so negatively, so just give me a couple minutes, and we'll just try to turn this around, because 
there is something you can build it on, and Bible authority is the one thing. When it talks, and we use this reference so many times, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, that uh, a child is taught the scriptures because it's able to make that person wise through salvation, which is in Christ Jesus. It's a claim for the Bible, not for the works of men. We have a mortal soul because we recognize that the dead don't know anything. You know, and Sister Dorothy and I have been talking about this quite recently. A lot of people in Canada want to be cremated these days. And they choose the cremation over to be, have a burial. I don't know what they do in New Zealand, but we, we find cremation is becoming very popular. It's not the same. People need to see a body dead. The kids need to see. That's uncle such and such. That's grandpa or that's, that's somebody, maybe even one of their own contemporaries. And they're dead. They're not alive. Go and see. They're dead. That'll help you with this. They don't know anything. Their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. We need to see that, to have that scripture confirmed for us. So it's a mortal soul. So when are we ever going to get anything, uh, you know, or ever see these people again or see the promises fulfilled? Well, the return of the Lord. That's a major teaching of the scripture. Major teaching, the resurrection. Major teaching, that the judgment. Major teaching, the granting of immortality. And this idea here that mortals shall put on immortality. Not that we have it, but that we, we could be clothed with it at the coming of the Lord and the judgment. The second death, for those who have been judged unworthy, they would die again, and that's the death from which there is no revival. And then God sets up his kingdom on earth. A thousand year reign of, of the Lord. Now, I just think, brothers and sisters, that we've got to talk this up. There is not a greater invitation we'll ever receive than what we get in the Bible. There's nothing that people can do compared with this. Who else is going to offer you to be able to reign a thousand years with Christ and to set this world right according to what God intended? That only comes from reading, understanding, obeying, and following this teaching, which is our, being our heritage as Christadelphians, that that's the way it will end. So we just alert you to verse 4 of Revelation chapter 18. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. If there was anything to conclude this by, in terms of people we may know who are Roman Catholics, and with the very first verse of a house on fire, it would be to be able to say to them at least this, that the Bible calls on people in that organization to come out of her, that you don't partake of her sins, and that you don't receive her plagues. I think that's our obligation to Roman Catholics that we meet, and on occasions where God provides an opportunity to speak about them. Thank you.